cool. Hey everyone, welcome to Brand Purpose and Growth. Factor Fad, we apologize for the little change in time. We pushed 30 minutes back. I'm actually feeling like I'm reporting you right now from a storm. We're still safe from Hurricane Laura. Wishing everyone that's actually going through this hurricane that still has power some safety as well. Um, we're letting everyone make themselves comfortable. We'll finish right on time, y'all. And this is meant to be a conversation. So we hope that everyone here will ask questions throughout. Um, thank you, Sharon. We definitely will stay safe and we'll definitely make sure our team members are safe as well. And for those of y'all that have not met uh, Mayur or heard of him before, um, he's someone that's wonderful that I've, I've gotten the blessing to know for the last couple of months. We've been working on this presentation. It was actually the presentation I was really bummed out I missed on at Challenger Brands uh, ad week earlier this year. It was too packed of a session. So props to you, man, for uh, packing out the house and not being able to uh, let everyone uh, come in. But on that note, for today's session, uh, make yourself comfortable. It is being recorded, so this will be sent out afterwards. There is a to-do afterwards as well. And, you know, we're so excited to have Mayer here today because he was one of the most requested speakers and web webinar hosts people have wanted over the last couple of months. So if you remember during Betsy's webinar, we asked, who would you love to see? And a lot of people shared his name. And so I shot him an email and a LinkedIn message. Didn't think he'd get back to me. He got back and he actually watched our webinar too from Betsy. So Betsy, if you're listening, oh, you're actually peeked at the webinar uh, for LinkedIn that you shared. And he said, I would love to help. And so over the last couple of months, we were working on this presentation together. It's an update from the Challenger Brands presentation. When he walked me through it, man, was I scribbling notes. It was hard for me to really sit down and say like, and actually listen just as an attendee. But we're so excited to have you. I think uh, for the sake of starting on time, we can go right into it. So Mayor, why don't you uh, kick things off and we'll be fielding questions here and we'll keep it conversational because right today, it's all about you guys. So take it away, man. It's all yours. Man. Thanks, thanks, Kenny, and great, great to be here. Thank you and Gus for having me over. And uh, that was a very exciting intro. I wish I had known you were going to do that. I would have put myself on a speaker, have my daughters here and my wife, uh, because they don't think I'm worth anything. So it was, it was my uh, moment of glory, which I missed, but hopefully we'll try again. Um, also about that room where you want able to make it. It was easy enough to pack that room. It was pretty tiny. So don't, uh, you guys don't have to judge anything by that, but uh, very excited to be here. And like Kenny mentioned, um, you know, please feel free to stop me through the presentation. The intent is not to go through every single slide if we, if we run out of time, but to make it more conversational, to, to start at a high level. But the idea is to be able to go deep dive into 10 clicks down if we have to, to talk about what is it that one of us could do differently later today or tomorrow at work. So um, let's make it very informal, uh, very conversational. And, and also if you wanna challenge some thinking, you know, please do, that's how you go along. So I'll go straight in. Um, obviously no, nothing on this slide is, is uh, unusual other than the fact that I'm sure many of you will wonder what brand purpose and growth, why is that? Why should that be a fad? Because uh, we all believe in brands or at least why they should exist. We all believe in purpose. I'm sure each one of us have our own individual purpose and mission in life. And we all believe that if we are marketeers, then you know, we are accountable for growth. That, that's why we exist. That's the kind of work we all want to do. But to be quite candid, you know, on ground reality, I'm not sure uh, how many of you actually see that or how many of you actually feel it? Of course, these concepts of brand and growth exist, but do they coexist um, in ground reality? And from my vantage point, from what I see, you know, we are all trying to climb a mountain every single day and, and you wonder on which side of the mountain you'll fall, on the brand side or on the growth side. Uh, and I honestly feel as marketeers, what we are trying to do to prevent that fall is quite scary. You know, it's... Uh, it's almost putting a question mark on the craft, the art and science of marketing. Um, and we'd love to talk about why that is happening and how we can prevent it. But before we go down that path, I, I usually like to share this one screen as one last uh, chance for you all to drop off this conference. Kenny and Gus may not like it, 
but uh, you're about to spend the next 50 minutes listening to an engineer telling the best marketeers on what's messed up about marketing and how to save it. So this is the screen I've grown up um, looking at. And, um, but if you're still on this, this conference, then you are in it. But um, because of that, uh, because of what you're seeing right now, no brainer that my career trajectory started off with pure technology. You know, I worked at a company called Sapien, which is now part of Publicis. Started my career as a pure engineer. Um, everything you can imagine, Java, JDB, C++, was a DBA, a Unix administrator, and then um, happened to have come at the intersection of tech and marketing and advertising early on in the 2000s, built ad tech products and evolved took some baby steps, led digital and e-commerce, then got into healthcare, into entertainment, uh, at a fascinating brand called, you know, Spotify, of course, and, and then in food and wellness and, and whatnot. So it's been all over the place. Um, I call myself as a misfit marketeer uh, or an engineer who's still trying to figure out what the heck marketing is. Um, and when I wear that hat and wear, you know, apply that perspective and I look back, uh, not going too far back because don't want us to judge our ages, but I think about the the landscape of marketing or the evolution of marketing in three broad eras. Um, and let's start with the 1970s, um, 70s to the 2000s. I call that um, the first era, or I call it the the dark era of brands. And I call it that way because this is when you know it was all about the madmen of marketing, you know, it was all about the Midas touch. It was all about who had more money or, you know, the best agencies that could create uh, the next best, most witty ad or who could get the best Super Bowl spot. And from all practical purposes, it all worked because as consumers, we really didn't have much choice, right? We were all quite gullible. We were all watching these things. Every brand was saying, I'm, I'm whiter, I'm softer. Um, than every other guy. I'm, I'm unique just like the other brand. And, uh, and we saw that, we got inspired or influenced. We would walk down the aisle and buy something. And, and marketing was pretty much a black box. You know, there was no, not much technology, not much data. Um, and you know, you, half of, we all believe that half of marketing worked and the other half didn't work. We just did not know which half that was. And that was marketing. And very important, to keep in mind that that is what set the tone and perception for marketing, you know, those 30 to 40 years. Um, the second era is what I call the, the decade of digital confusion, um, starting 2000 to somewhat 2008, nine, there was a proliferation of technology, you know, the, the MarTech landscape, new buzzwords were coming in, new technology um, you know, was innovated and brought on, even if you did not know and understand anything, you better be investing in so-called marketing tech and ad tech and buzzwords, the DMPs, the DSPs, you know, programmatic media buying became a big thing. Big data was a big thing for many years. Of course, e-commerce was on the rise, CRM, mobile marketing, content marketing, email marketing, all kinds of things, you know, were happening. And I'm sure you all have seen this incredible landscape and Scott Brinker has been a dear friend, a mentor of mine, uh, you know, for very early on in the 2000s, um, where it was just a plethora of all these platforms, all these technologies that were coming on. But fundamentally, we were all looking at this as a bolt on. We all looked at digital as a thing. And we all compartmentalized that as digital marketing versus marketing only up until we all learned through our mistakes and I did too, uh, that it, no, it was no longer digital marketing. It was really about marketing in the digital world. It was about living and operating in a digital world with a consumer who was inherently living a digital life where uh, our children and you know, the Gen Z's and the younger millennials don't use the word digital. You know, it only, it's only the businesses and the brands, some of them are the incumbents. They are the only ones who use that. Many companies don't have that word in their vernacular because people never grown up thinking that. And then came the third era, which I call the, the growth at all cost era, starting with 2008 somewhat onwards, you know, with as iOS and iPhone came out and Facebook became a platform, you know, that shifted marketing 
from a pure black box, the Midas touch of those 1970s to 2000s, knee jerked onto the complete extreme right, um, where it became all about growth, you know, where um, nothing else mattered. You know, your purpose, your soul did not matter. All that mattered was, hey, let's acquire users. Uh, didn't matter what they were coming in for, as long as they were coming at an efficient cost. And I don't know how many of you know this individual. He's Chamat Palyapatia. He was the first growth person hired by Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook, I think, in, if I'm not wrong, 2007, 2008 timeframe. And he, you know, he's, he's been the person um, who was the architect for getting Facebook to their billion user. And he built the first so-called growth stream in the Silicon Valley. And since then, the, the concept of a growth team that sits on top of a marketing and a product team became a phenomenon, especially in the Valley with a lot of, you know, a lot of venture back companies. Um, but that was a genesis and that did a lot of good things and great things. I'm sure at Facebook, a lot of the people who sit in growth, you know, were planted by him. He brought them on and a lot of those people have then left Facebook to, you know, either spin off their own companies, very successful ones at that. Um, in hindsight, when I look back at it, I think it's, it's created that function of growth outside of marketing, outside of product. It does two things. On, on one hand, of course, it was brilliant for Facebook back then. But what it does, it, it cannibalizes you know, the core functions because it allows you or it believes that traditional marketing function, the traditional product function can continue to suck, that they don't move the needle, that the, uh, the mindset in those core functions doesn't really drive business growth. Hence, we have to bring or orchestrate a different team that's going to think and operate differently. And, and that's been the phenomenon in, in many of the organizations. And that also kind of had have an impact on some of the most legacy top brands who've always been driven by marketing where they, they got into the state of confusion. So back in 2017, Coke replaced the CMO function with the chief growth officer function. It's a different thing. They've gone back to being the chief marketing officer because the problem within marketing was never about what you called it. It wasn't the semantics. It was the underlying core principle that marketing and marketers were not holding themselves accountable for what was relevant to the business and the growth. So there was something more fundamental that had to be shifted. And unfortunately, what that led to was this bifurcation within marketing. You know, this, this belief that if you're investing in the so-called brand, it is not going to move the needle. And if you want to move the needle, then stop investing in that and start investing in growth marketing or AKA performance marketing. And now it's almost, it's almost become a choice as opposed to an end between these two uh, indices of marketing. And that last 10 to 12 years of marketing, the growth at all cost mindset has gotten us to a state of marketing where it, mar most marketing has lost its soul. You know, it has lost uh, its purpose. It's become soulless. It's become so binary where most brands, especially younger stage companies are literally throwing discounts. You know, th they are talking so functionally at you. And interestingly enough, it's working. It works in the first five, six, seven years up until you reach the product market fit, you reach that scale. And that's the time you realize that just offering and fulfilling functional, functional and utilitarian value for the consumer is not enough. Because when you do that, you do bring them into your ecosystem at a pretty efficient cost, but it's almost impossible to keep them. Retention becomes your biggest challenge because the way you retain consumers is on one hand, adding incremental value every single time, but it's not just a functional value. It is the emotional and the cultural value as well, especially with the younger millennials, especially with Gen Z's who care more about your purpose. They care more about the why behind what you produce and not just what you give them as a product. And, and that's why, um, you know, as we all think about, or most businesses think about this in separate, you know, the separation between purpose and growth, what we all are missing is the fact that the consumer is not sitting in any one of these axes. The consumer is sitting right at the intersection point. And that is the mission and that is the opportunity and the challenge that we all have, you know, as marketers. And we all have to ask ourselves that question that shouldn't marketing's purpose be growth? Because if it isn't about growth, why should we exist? And we'll talk about what the definition of that growth. It's not just a quantitative number. But if you don't hold yourself accountable to move the needle, then we, don't, we shouldn't be sitting there. 
And as a matter of fact, when you apply that, then you should ask yourself, shouldn't marketing apply the purpose of why you exist as a business? That purpose should be a catalyst to growth. It shouldn't be an obstacle to growth. Right? Like you can't be questioning um, these two as disconnected, isolated, you know, pathways to move ahead. And when I, at least when I think about growth, I don't think about that in isolation. Um, where I don't separate the brand from the tangible numeric growth. And I feel that long-term sustainable growth, not short-term, short-term you can grow, you know, you throw, you know, dots in, in the dark and one way or the other, you hit the bullseye, but it's only up until a certain point. Long-term sustainable growth happens at the intersection of growing the brand, growing your user base, growing your user value. It's not an either or, it's an and. And that is the, that is a challenge. That is a mountain that marketing and marketeers have to climb, not by themselves, but partnering very closely with product, with data, with science, with engineering, you know, but that is very important. These are the three flywheels um, that are constantly running. And the challenge that we all have is how do you show and prove the incrementality across the three in isolation? We've proven, I'm sure we all have enough case studies to say, Hey, I'm using science to drive efficient user growth, AKA acquisition. I'm doing, I'm working with product and data in science to prove retention and LTV. I did X, Y, and Z to improve my awareness for my brand and the affinity. But do we have proof points to show when I move that needle on the brand awareness, this is the efficiency gain it drove on my CAC. And when I brought that user at a lower volume perhaps, but at a more efficient CAC, actually the LTV and the retention rate for that type of user was much higher than the user who came on the backing of a pure discount. That is the opportunity, the, the interconnectivity that we have to prove across these three flywheels. And the reason why today, now is the time for us to prove that is because unfortunately, whether we like it or not, the word brand has, has almost become a stigma in many organizations, especially you know, venture backed, high growth stage companies where you almost look down upon creativity, storytelling, and any kind of investment in so-called brand. But I feel, see, I don't blame a lot of those non-brand efforts or people who believe that way, because a bit of that is something that marketing and marketeers have to solve. And I say that because I feel we confuse the brand from brand marketing. And I think we should, I, I just want to spend a minute and a half, two minutes on this slide because it took me a lot of years to finally figure out why does that happen? Why are CEOs, founders, or, or product people always questioning the function of brand marketing? Is because when we as marketeers, when we talk about brand, we narrow it down to the, the concept of investing in top of funnel, the concept of investing in non-DR marketing effort. Whereas the brand, um, the way we may define it is not just limited to that top of funnel non-DR marketing effort. The brand as we are talking about is a function and an outcome of every single thing that every single individual in an organization does. From the person um, you know, who is responsible to clean the office space, from the employees who are working in a remote location in a whole different geography, from the person who picks up the phone when a customer doesn't get the box they were supposed to get today, you know, from the person who's designing your own platform experience or the person who's, who's responsible to design uh, and define the structure of your packaging. Every single aspect of you as a company impacts, builds or breaks your brand. The top of funnel brand marketing is only one cog in that entire wheel. And when you think like that, marketing is not the owner of the brand. They may be the orchestrator of that process, but every single person, every single function in the organization has to own the brand and play their part in driving it forward. And that's a very important distinction. The reason I'm bringing that up is as marketeers, if you do not get the investment to invest in top of funnel, that's totally fine. It's not the end of the world. It doesn't mean that you don't have other levers to impact and build that brand. And the opportunity we all have is how do you transform and translate your lower funnel effort 
your performance marketing, your Facebook asset, your email, your blog, your tweet. How do you have each one of those levers reflect that brand, that brand promise, that brand foundation, and then relationships. How do you build that strong relationship with product, with engineering, with data, with science, because marketing, especially, <clears throat> especially at a time where it is evolving so rapidly, it is one of the only functions in the C-suite that has dramatically shifted and been disrupted in a good way in the last 10 to 15 years. So the onus of actually reflecting the purpose of marketing is more on marketeers and it has to be done first internally within the organization before we do it outside with the customers. And we have a, we have a question from the crowd. Man. Okay, great. Uh, let's, let's go. We have, we have two, two thoughts that if you can expand on one, one question is if you could elaborate on how this, how, how brand uh, has been stigmatized in, in companies and maybe articulate a little bit more of how it has been stigmatized. And then, and then someone's asking is how can brand related to be more related to culture? So those two, two thoughts, whether it's organizational yes. culture yes. or, yeah. Yes. Great questions. Um, so obviously it's, it's always impossible to generalize um, anything, but I'll give you examples of two macro archetypes of companies where brand is a stigma and where brand will likely not be a stigma. And the two archetypes, again, these are general, so I'm abstracting it. There is one archetype, which is more traditional CPG brands. These are the companies that are not direct to consumer. These are the companies that are still selling. Their primary business model is still via retail. The reason why that business model is very important is, see, for those organizations, brand is their only lever. And of course, the core product as well, so product innovation. But what drives a consumer to make that purchase on a retail environment, you know, in walking down the aisle is ultimately their perception of that product, which is reflected through your brand. And those organizations will always lean on the brand and the investment on the brand. They are the ones where you will never have a problem investing in top of funnel. You'll never have a problem in questioning, you know, the investment, uh, which is not as directly attributable or measurable. Okay. So if you sit there, you know, you're a great spot. Your challenge isn't the investment in brand. Your challenge is attribution. Your challenge is if you invested $10 million in that top of funnel effort, hey, what did that do to, to my actual tangible sales and growth? And you are leaning on to the traditional MMM model, working with the Nielsen's of the world, you know, who will do a nine month or six month study. That's fair. The challenge is that is not reflective of where most of the industry is going, where everyone's moving to direct to consumer model, where um, there is no um, gap between yourself and the customer where there's no dearth of data, where is, there is no dearth of a technical, there's no technical limitation in your ability to measure, to measure attribution. What happens in that situation is when you have a hundred dollars, you are likely going to spend each ounce of that hundred dollar, each penny of that hundred dollar on a channel that is absolutely addressable, that is absolutely measurable, especially when you are in your, uh, zero to one stage when you're still trying to prove your product market fit. And when you do prove your product market fit, you get to scale, you get so used to that drug of proving every single dollar of just focusing on same day gratification that look, if I have a hundred dollars and if I give you a choice, you know what, for these hundred dollars, I can actually bring 25 customers. Or do you rather, you know, or do you rather spend only $50 or $75 on bringing customers? Let me spend $25 on something that will help these customers in the longer run. If you're a founder, I can bet you nine or 10 will say, you know what, screw you. Just spend every single hundred dollar to bring those 50 customers. I don't care about mid to long term. It's not their fault. You know, most of the businesses that have raised venture money are running on monthly quarterly goals, short term KPI. It's very hard for them right now to think mid to long term. It's in those organizations where brand becomes a stigma. They don't want to spend money on something which is not as clearly visible as performance marketing or DR efforts are, where it is hard for them to believe that if I'm spending $100, wait, hold on, you're gonna take 10 weeks to come and tell me what that $25 did? That's the place where we have to bring that balance. And we'll talk about in the second half of this conversation, we'd love to dig into the how, because I still haven't cracked open it. Uh, I'm still trying to figure it out. And what we all have to do is get creative with how do you not 
let go of the brand because this brand is your soul, is the purpose. And in the short term, the users will come through because they're seeing the functional value. Sometimes they're seeing the financial value of the discounts that most brands throw out. The only way you keep that user to come back one more time and maximize the LTV is when they truly understand who you are and why you exist. And now you are emotionally and culturally connected with that customer. That's awesome. That was, uh, I, I feel like that was a super helpful ex example and answer of the stigmatizing brand. Thank you. And I would actually love if there is somebody out there who is working in the non-CPG, direct-to-consumer um, growth stage company, or even an incumbent, and you have somehow figured out this magical balance to invest in top of funnel, invest in the serendipity of brand, right? Alongside really hammering home the lower funnel growth, performance marketing, partnership with product. Please share those ideas because I can bet you that out of a thousand marketeers out there, at least 975 would love to get those examples so that we can, we can apply them, adopt and adapt them into our respective ecosystems. That's and awesome. there was another question because that was, um, I forgot. The line uh, between brand and culture. Because uh, you were talking through the ecosystem yes. of what contributes to brand. Yes. Yeah, so that's a, that's a more philosophical uh, question, which I'm happy to share my, my two cents. Um, and as background, I'm a Nichiren Buddhist. So everything I'm going to talk about culture for is, is stems off of that life philosophy, which by the way, is my understanding of marketing as well. If you look at all the core principles of good marketing, because I, I think there are only two types of marketing, good marketing or bad marketing. Everything else is mechanics that we built. But I think good marketing is very simply just being a good human. You know, think about it. It should be authentic. It should have courage. It should be honest. It should be brave. Um, it should listen. Those are the things that my parents tried to teach me when I was growing up. I didn't listen to them. I came out whichever way, but, but that's what I try to teach my daughter. So it's, Good marketing and being a good human aren't uh, unseparable at all. You know, it's, yes, we can apply the four A's, four P's, and X number of C's and D's, but at the end, marketing is very simple. We've complicated it. And when I apply that to this, to this phenomena that brand and culture and brand reflects your culture, I think that we don't have to overcomplicate it. A culture that you want to represent and reflect outside the organization is, is at the end of the day is a mirror to the culture you have within the organization. It's how you treat your employees, you know, how, how much you trust your employees, because that's the same trust that will reflect um, in your relationship with your customers. Because if you don't trust your employees, I can bet you 9.9 .9 out of 10 times, if not 10 out of 10 times, because sometimes you can be successful having a facade, at least for a stipulated period of time. If you don't trust your employees, your customers will never ever trust you as a brand, as a business, as a product. So in my mind, this is why, you know, this slide, um, I think it was ahead here. The definition of brand for me is not equal to brand marketing. That is just a marketing effort to reflect the brand. When I talk about brand reflects your culture and the culture that you end up taking outside is a reflection of your brand. So it's a bi-directional arrow. What I mean by that is that brand as an outcome. It means that if I'm an employee of an organization, I'm walking down the street, I am the brand or I reflect the brand, right? I'm not isolated from it. It's when we are as employees tweeting and active on social, I'm a reflection, an extension of who I am inside the organization. And the biggest reflectors of my brand are my customers. It's my product. You know, it's my packaging. You can't isolate that. And, and that's what I mean. So uh, mm -hmm. that's why I think brand and culture are inseparable, but it's, there's no such thing as um, a culture you want to shape in the society outside as being different from the culture you have inside the organization. And awesome. a big reason I feel why we all struggle with this is as marketeers and as marketing is because over the period I feel we started to confuse marketing's outcomes from marketing outputs. And what I mean by outputs are the things we do as marketers, the channels, the campaigns, the data, the tests. 
those are all enablers. At the end, the outcomes, um, we have to go back to the outcomes of marketing, which, which let's talk about what those are. I define those as, as three core outcomes. So let's put that in the context of a total addressable market, which is a core to any business. At the end, whatever you are doing is always in response to the addressable market um, for which you're trying to solve a problem. So let's say as marketing, one of your core purposes is to identify which part of that total addressable market you don't have the right to win and right to play. So that becomes your filter. Uh, I hope you all have a sense of that because you know, try to win that market, that part of market is a wasted effort. But as you dive deeper, the first outcome of marketing or the first purpose of marketing is at the end of the day, create new demand. That's the that's the portion of your market, the segment of your market that you believe you have the right to win, but you just won't win it on the inertia of the product you have. And that's where marketing has to play the role of softening that ground by educating, inspiring, and influencing that segment so that eventually through other strategies, you can then scoop it and bring it home. So that's one, it's creating the new demand. And this is where I personally hold the brand marketing as a function, creative storytelling as the lever responsible to create that demand, because that's the segment that isn't just coming because you gave them a three for 99 or you gave them three months off. They are going to come because they have to find that shareable vision, you know, and, and, and the culture um, and something more emotional, not just utilitarian. The second outcome that marketing should hold itself accountable for is then what do you do to capture that demand, the softened ground in the most efficient and effective way? So it's not just about the lowest cost, but it is the right cost for the right value that that customer brings. And that's why it's a mindset shift from just thinking about CAC, for example, to thinking about the ratio of LTV to CAC, because you should be open to paying 2x more for a user who's going to be 10x more value to the company. And then the third is, this is where you throw the kitchen sink as an organization. You do everything possible in your capacity to retain that demand because this is the hardest and the steepest mountain to climb for any company. It's easier to bring people through. You know, it's like easy to get, get on a first date, but uh, you have to be your true self uh, and your true best self to bring the user back one more time and one more time and so on. So those are the three outcomes of marketing. Everything else we do has to ladder up to those outcomes uh, and how you measure the impact and whatnot. Needless to say, you know, if you're a startup, look, your funnel's different. So these outcomes vary based on what stage of a journey you are in. Because if you're a startup, you know, I'm not advocating that you spend, um, you know, 25 of those $100 you have in building that brand. If you're a startup, your entire focus is to optimize your core product experience for the niche audience and keep iterating it to prove the product market fit. You're just trying to use you know, the $5 to bring 10 users in, et cetera. But as you grow, that funnel starts to inverse again because you've now saturated your low hanging fruit demand. Now you have to create scale. That is when you start to converge the emotional and functional value. So it's not an either or, it is also contextual to who you are, where you are in the journey. So all that was theory and philosophically, all of that makes sense. It's easy enough for us to talk about it, but there are four or five principles um, that I've tried to apply with varying levels of successes and failure um, in how you do that, uh, you know, very practically in, in our jobs. So I'll take you through it, but again, feel free to stop me or if there are any questions. Okay. First is, as marketeers, we have to hold ourselves accountable and measure our success against outcomes and not outputs. What I mean by that is, yes, you may have a lot of leading KPIs, leading indicators, you know, your proxy KPIs, your vanity KPIs, all kinds of acronyms. At the end, at the end of a month, at the end of the week, at the end of the day, hold yourself accountable to say, everything that I'm doing, how is that laddering up to either creating new demand, which would not have come otherwise, or capturing that demand or retaining that demand and figure out how you get creative with what those KPIs are and report on it. Because one of the biggest challenges marketing has is the fact that it's always been a black box. But the rest of the world doesn't believe in that black box. The rest of the world has been trained to know if I'm putting a dollar in, what's coming out? We have to prove the incrementality of marketing. 
which means that you use all kinds of tools and tactics and capabilities and tests and ABs and multi-touches to figure out, okay, at the end of the day, the value of marketing is determined by the amount of growth and the users and the emotional impact you have, which would not have existed in the absence of marketing. And that's up to us to figure out every single day. And as we know, marketing, we are on this journey from the non-measurable to the measurable marketing. And being someone who's grown with data and technology and product, um, on one hand, I believe in increasing more and more visibility into the impact of marketing, but I'm also on the flip side a believer that 100% of marketing should never be measurable because if it is, it'll become too binary. You still want that serendipity and the irrationality because at least as long as you're selling something to human beings, when we get to the stage in our lives where we start selling stuff to machines and aliens, that's when you know, 100% of marketing can become measurable because the emotion and the soul will not matter. The challenge though is- hey, I, lo I love what you just said on that because one thing that we hear a lot from our clients is that they wanna measure everything. I wanna make sure we reiterate re what you just said is that you should still have that serendipity and an openness in your marketing. That was a very great point. You're gonna reiterate that. The caveat though, Kenny, ground reality is if I'm the CEO, I'm like, Dude, I want to know every single penny of the hundred dollars. The caveat is we have to earn the right to spend the 15 out of the hundred dollars on something that is non-measurable. It's not slam dunk. And I'll talk about one way that I've tried to do it. Uh, it's worked sometimes, sometimes it hasn't worked. But at the end, it's always that choice between the short term and long term. It's always a choice between, hey, do I hit my CAC goals? Do I hit my user acquisition goals? Or can I win the trust with the CFO, with the CEO, with the founder, you know, to say, look, just let's spend X amount here and the Y amount mid to long term. But I promise I'm going to come back and show the correlation that the mid term and long term impact existed. And I can correlate it back to those $15 that I spent out of the hundred, because if you don't do that, um, you know, it's going to be hard to win. And also we've got to have respect for why that question exists because we are coming off of 40 years of marketing, which was absolutely unmeasurable. For many, many people who are CFOs and CEOs, they still think most of that non-DIA marketing as it's a black box where money goes in, never comes back. And that creates a divide between the brand effort, and th this is more the top of our brand marketing and growth slash performance marketing, right? And the strategy to do that is challenge yourself to invest 80 or 85, whatever your ratio is on the measurable part of marketing and hold yourself accountable to use that 80 to 85 to hit hundred percent of your business goals. And the way I think about that is that 80 to 85 performance, DR tangible marketing is your oxygen. You need that every single day because you can barely last more than 10, 15 minutes. Actually, no, whatever, 30 seconds without that, right? depending on different, all of our different capabilities and capacities as humans. But you cannot survive a day without that part. That's a given in today's world. The 10 to 15 to 20%, that's nutrition. Without that, also you will die, you know, but it will be a slow death. It's up to us to prove that. The, the key though is you don't switch it. This is what 40 years of marketing has been. 20% has been measurable, 80% unmeasurable or non-measurable. And when you do that, that's when the monkey gets on your back. So we have to make sure that 80 to 85% of marketing works, is tangible, same day, and you use that to get to 100% of the goal because that's what gives you the $15 to spend on stuff that doesn't matter anymore to the business. And that is what you use you know, to, to drive that emotional connection to build that serendipity with your audience. And one tactical way that I do that is operate marketing like a business, operate marketing like a PNL. Measure every ounce of it, and and whichever way there is a there is a sample PNL that I've used in the past, and I'll work with Kenny and Gus, and we'll share that on LinkedIn in the next few days. A, a template you can take it, trash it, edit it, but at the end, every marketer should have their respective PNL in their back pocket because without that, none of us have the right to be on that table. Marketing that stands up for purpose 
without growth, without profitability, doesn't stand a chance. We, uh, Mayer, we have a question speaking yeah. on the on the measurement side. So, for from this is a question from actually a previous okay. webinar speaker. We have Fred Schoenberg from uh, Venture Fuel, who's an awesome person to speak on innovation. But his question is about B two B and and organizations and industries that have extremely slow sales cycles, multiple decision makers, and have a lot of challenges with attribution. So for organizations like that, do you have any ideas or suggestions around balancing the need for measuring yeah. with also that serendipitous brand value that influences those decision makers over time? Yes, that's a brilliant question um, because measurability <clears throat> and data has a lot of caveats underneath. And I feel this is where marketing today is no longer art and science. It's art in science and science and art. What I mean by that is in a scenario like that, where let's assume your time to close, you know, a B2B deal is like three months or in some cases, six months, you know, but you are investing effort. You're investing dollars in those three to six months. You know, how do you prove something's working or not working? I think that's where you apply creative thinking to data. Um, mm. and identify leading KPIs, you know, and th there's this, the, the leading versus lagging KPIs and North star versus contributing KPIs. So that's where you figure out, okay, are there early signals that I can identify, which correlate ultimate, ultimately to a sale, you know, to a big win. What are those? So use data to figure out, look, if I'm, if I'm doing X, Y, and Z, I'm driving more people to my dot com because I'm investing in more. Uh, inbound content. I'm creating a blog, which is an investment. You may not be able to show ROI in two weeks, but can you show the fact that you now have 2% more number of organic visitors coming to the site? You can show, you know, 10 percentage point difference in the no amount of time they're spending per session. Now, those are leading indicators. None of that is yet driving a sale or a closure, but you are creatively thinking about the incremental leading KPIs that ultimately correlate to that conversion, which ultimately then further correlates to a higher engaged customer with a higher LTV, lower churn rate, you know, with the higher, mm -hmm. you know, average order value and things like that. So I think um, the key is, again, that's a very real and tangible problem that we all have, not just in B2B, even in direct to consumer, you're investing in non DR marketing effort. How are you going to measure it? Because in today's world, no CFO, no CEO, has the patience and rightly so because the VC is not giving you a one year runway to say, you know, take my $50 million and just go spend, come back two years later. So nobody has the luxury to give you six months to tell me, come back and tell me using a traditional MMM study or X, Y, and Z study to tell me what did your $15 do? What we have to do is are there leading KPIs, which are early signals, early indicators that can show, look, if this happened, inevitably something else will happen because I've correlated in the past. So one simple example, and again, I don't work at Freshly anymore, but I thought this is a good example that, that we all drove is, you know, we launched a blog uh, at Freshly and I have many examples from my past experience at Spotify and Kimberly Clark and even places where none of us may have worked. But here was an example where we invested in that 15%, in that $15, through a blog post because we realized that, you know, we are a very, very fast growing direct to consumer brand, but we really did not have a brand yet. People didn't really understand who we were, what we were trying to sell. They didn't even believe that we had these humans cooking these freshly fully prepared meals. So we thought, why don't we start to highlight, you know, our nutrition philosophy, highlight user stories, um, highlight our, our chefs, who were coming up with these meals almost like a new song because they had a thesis, you know, they had their own story behind every single meal. And while I could not, or the team could not directly correlate this investment, which included investing in content and in writers, investing in the underlying platform, investing in new attribution, measurability, KPIs and dashboards, you know, in the first three to four months, it was tough to really have tangible and, and big enough impact to acquisition begin in impact to retention and engagement, but we started to measure the traffic change. We started to measure how many existing users were now spending time, you know, on this content. Then we started to correlate the users who actually spend four and a half minutes reading, you know, the blog on a weekly basis, do they engage differently? Is their reordering pattern different? 
then ultimately over a two to three month period, you start to have enough data to predict their LTV compared to a user who never clicked on any of this content, which you use as a proxy to figure out, do they really understand your core product? Or did they just click you know, on, a, on a nine second video, they clicked on the third second on a platform like Facebook, clicked on your ad, just converted right away. You can all only imagine how much they truly understood your product and you can tie that, uh, use that as a proxy to correlate an early churn or a late retention. Okay, so I know I'm, we're running out of time, so I'm gonna quickly go through these four or five and then open up for any more questions. Second, organize around outcomes, which I think is single-handedly the, uh, the most uh, impactful um, uh, step you can take to either make or break marketing and have marketing uh, impact those outcomes. What I mean by that is at the end of the day, how you organize and how you operate within marketing and across marketing and product, marketing and engineering, you know, marketing and sales, if you're still a more traditional B2B company, those relationships and those, the, the operating model ultimately um, is going to reflect what your customer experience is. Because if those pipes are broken, if you are fragmented internally on how you are organized and how you operate, it will reflect in the kind of experiences you will take to the market. As an example, if your online team, which is the case in, in many of the multi-channel e-tail and retail players where their e-com team reported into a different president, their uh, traditional retail engines reported to a different president, more often than not, their data was isolated and fragmented. If you get a coupon in a retail environment, you cannot apply that online. If you have an online discount, you cannot apply that when you walk inside the store. As a customer, they don't see these isolations. They don't see, they don't say, oh, I'm gonna do analog shopping today, so I'm gonna walk inside a store. Oh, I, I feel more digital today, so I'm gonna go online and buy online. For them, there is no separation. All they are looking for is the most value at the right price, at a location and touch point of their choice. And how you organize, how you operate, ultimately determines how you understand the customer and the experiences you will drive. And, and then how you operate, how you hold yourself accountable as marketing is, is embed and, and implement and adopt methodologies that will hold marketing accountable. Whether that is OKRs or anything else, I share OKRs because you know, it's very widely spread, used by product, used by engineering, it holds you accountable, not just to the intangible outcome and impact of marketing, but also very tangible KRs, which are relevant, also helps you connect horizontally with product to make sure that marketing doesn't end up being on an island, which is a big challenge that marketing in most organizations have. Third, do the wiring. You know, so yes, we spoke about all the different pieces, but in most organizations, marketing is more like that. We have all the pieces, but they are mostly disconnected. It's also a function of, how much marketing has evolved with so many touch points, um, you know, so many channels. And I think I won't be lying if I said, even though we all want to be customer obsessed, most marketing organizations are channel obsessed because that's how we incentivize, that's how the industry is orchestrated, that's how we hire, that's how the data is collected. And the challenge we have is how do you glue it all together with data, you know, with the power of your purpose and your mission and your brand. Fourth, very importantly, um, be inspired by data. Don't get dependent by it because oh, I have many examples maybe for the next session is what happens when you become data dependent is you lose common sense. You lose serendipity and you just cannot move. You actually, you actually become really slow because you now want data to tell you every single answer. And you suddenly lose the fact that at the end, these are humans coming to your platform to engage. Um, and when you apply that hat, you also realize and you believe that it is a part of being user obsessed is all about not just understanding what the people are doing, what your customer is doing on platform, which your first party data tells you very clearly, what you have to invest in is understanding why they are doing that is a causality. And that's where it's a convergence of, yes, your first party data, which is magical, but then along with that, a bit of that more traditional call and con, talk to your customers you know, and uh, ask them questions, listen and understand, and then converge that with your first party data because that information, especially when you connect all the distinct pieces, 
on platform data, off platform data, channel A, channel B, call and con. That's when you truly have a chance to really understand your customer. Um, and then when you do that, you, you then challenge yourself to define the lifetime value of your customer, which, which I hope that is not limited to just the financial lifetime value because each customer, especially in a growth universe, has both financial and non-financial LTV. How many of your customers are truly advocates? How many of your customers are really driving incremental growth through network effects, through virality? and start to figure out a way to measure it. Because once you have that, you know, at a micro segment level, then you may be okay, actually very happy to pay 30% more for that type of customer, even though they buy less, but they actually help bring three more users. So they have such a high K factor that you start to appreciate that type of segment way more than someone who comes at a lower cost, a lower CAC and a lower LTV. Which means you have to invest the buy behind the what. Lastly, as marketing, um, let's evolve from the traditional campaign mindset to an always on engine and always on mindset because today's customer is always under warranty. You know, she is not waiting for your next Christmas campaign to make that purchase. She's doing that purchase, you know, at 1030 at night when the kids have gone to sleep is the only time she's got on her iPad. And if you're not there as a brand, you missed her. And in a world today where the customer has so much access, so much choice, um, so much discovery, um, if you miss her once, it's almost impossible to get her back. Um, so the one thing I challenge um, myself to do is move away from this concept of value of debt. So this is a product value of debt, which basically means that as a product person, you know, when you're running out of growth, when you're lagging behind your goals, what do you do? You launch a feature. And what happens, you know, two, three months after you launch that feature, you know, it dies on again. What do you do to make up for that? You launch another feature. By the end of this process, you have a product, you know, that is almost unusable because it has so many features. You never thought about usability. What do we do as marketers? You know, when you're running behind, we launch a campaign. What happens after that? Well, because nothing else followed, the users eventually churn and it waves away. What do we do? We launch another campaign. So this is a campaign value of debt or marketing's value of debt. Instead, what we have to hold ourselves accountable for is marketing never stops in listening in engaging in having those conversations. And absolutely, you will always have those key moments. Either these are cultural moments or business moments or product moments where you tap in, but there has to be that continuation before, during, and after. And that's what I call the always on engine. Lastly, there is no such thing as perfection in marketing. It's only experimentation. So don't invest six months trying to get the perfect answer because there's no such thing. Um, the only thing that is certain in marketing is your ability to test and your success or our success is determined by the rate of that experimentation, by the rate of those tests. So with that, I wanna end at least the presentation, we'll open up for Q&A uh, with one ask, if you're open to it, is what can you do in the next three days? And uh, if you're open to it, I would love for you all to share one idea or more um, that you either have that you wanna test or you have tested in the past where you have proven successfully that an authentic brand actually drives business growth. That brand and performance are inseparable. And if you can use a hashtag, brand is performance, that'll be fantastic. I'll post this tomorrow morning on LinkedIn um, and you can respond to that in your comments by giving your ideas. And Gus and Kenny said they will have uh, a unique prize. They will select one of you uh, with the best answer and they'll give you uh, a prize which will be worth at least a thousand bucks. Definitely remember saying that, I guess. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> For those that made it this no, far, awesome. congratulations. Um, no, this is, we we this do is have great, some man. really good questions too, man. Um, we have a couple minutes left. Uh, Kristen, actually, who is our next, spoiler alert, she's next month's webinar speaker, asked, would love to know who Meyer thinks is doing all this well. Who gets the intersection of brand and growth? Do you have any good examples, man? That's, um, that's a tough one. Um, I'll tell you, yes, th th there is one, which I don't know the details because sometimes it's tough to, uh, tough to really understand what's happening behind the hood to know what the impact is. But I'll give you one example, two examples actually, of brands. One is expected, the other one is not as expected. Who I feel 
are doing are really inspiring me as individually. Okay, one is Burger King. It's crazy, but and I've said this to Fernando, who's an incredible CMO. I really look up to him because he's he's a CMO that I feel who's absolutely proud of his background and his belief in creativity and storytelling and advertising. And this is coming from someone like me who's been so much on growth and, and data and technology. But what he is doing and his team is doing globally is proving that when you, have, when you are authentic, when you are brave, when you're taking those risks and using creative and, and storytelling and the power of content, it actually does work. And, and they have a lot of great studies, a uh, lot of great efforts and activations that I keep seeing. And what I asked him, I think a few weeks back was, man, like, when do you get it off? When do you get it wrong? Because I keep seeing time and time again, it becomes a habit. The second one, which I don't take it for granted, uh, is actually Nike. And I say, of course, every time people throw Nike, of course, you know, you got to do something for 50 years. But I'll tell you that success as a brand is not easy. It, and what I recognize and appreciate is I can tell you so many brands and, and founders and CEOs I've seen when you have success, when you have so much revenue behind you, you, you become less and less and less open to taking more risks. You become risk averse because you now have so much, you know, so much revenue and so much growth to protect. So let's not take it for granted that when Nike does it time and time again, they reflect the fact that when you stand up for your beliefs, when you stand up for who you are and why you exist. In the short term, it may backfire, but in the mid to long term, the consumers see through. The consumers can see through the facade and they are great examples of continuously you know, bringing out and throwing out incredible content that reflects the, ultimately the foundation of what Nike stands for. So true, man. And we'll close it out with this last question uh, from Miles here. Um, what, recommend, rec what recommendations do you have for an organization that believes it doesn't benefit much from typical marketing, meaning no need for social, no ads, <laughs> et cetera. Instead, we are much more targeted on ad spend on an individual or small group basis. Yes. And, and we are all surrounded by, by those. Uh, we, are, we are all living that. So I'll have a combination of um, suggestions and advice based on both successes and failures based on my own lesson learned. One is that do not give up. Don't be defeated. You're not the only one, if that helps at all. And, and also knowing that the wheel is turning around and there is going to be a sleuth of growth companies and startups who are now going to start proving that the ultimate answer and success is not either or, it is in that intersection. So that's one philosophical um, suggestion and advice that please don't give up, hang in there because the world's turning around and guess what COVID and this global crisis has been a blessing in disguise, which has taken all of us at all levels back to the drawing board, back to the basics, because this is what told us. And it's nobody else, but the customer, which is going to teach all of us a lesson that at the end uh, I'm going to buy and I'm going to connect myself with brands who actually share my values, who stand up for something. In the short term, there'll be brands who can have a facade and win. In the mid to long term, they won't sustain. So that's foundational. Tactical level, I would say, if there's one thing I would encourage each one of us to invest in is relationship, horizontal relationship. Build a strong relationship with product, with your counterpart on the product side. Build that relationship with data and science, with the CFO, with the finance team, with FPNA, and challenge yourself. And actually, one more part. If you happen to sit within marketing, if you happen to sit on the brand side of the creative team or content team, build that strong relationship with your own acquisition team, with your own retention team or your growth team, whatever it's called. It's first marketing has to bridge those gaps in internal to marketing. Then you start to bridge those gaps with product, with finance, with engineering. And there is nothing that is more magical that is going to be more impactful than your relationships because it is going to be a hard journey. And then thirdly is don't worry about changing the world. Just worry about how do I get some small wins? Can you get the two out of the hundred dollars? How can you use that together with product together with your acquisition team? Can you take, can you work with your acquisition team to take 2% of their acquisition spend, which I'm sure there is no dearth of just take 2% of the acquisition spend and change the asset to have that asset still drive action, 
still drive conversion, but have that asset reflect your brand. You know, whatever your design system is, whatever your tone of voice is, use that and see, does that work better? Because at the end of the day, if you can't prove that, then you do have to ask yourself a fair question. Look, if it doesn't work, then either I have to change my tone of voice or the foundation or my design system because the same consumer isn't coming through. So at the end, identify tactical short-term wins together with your acquisition team, your growth team, your product to see, can you have small wins to prove, oh, it actually does work slightly better, both in terms of short-term KPIs as well as mid to long-term KPIs. That was a great answer, man. And you know, right before we close, I wanna ask you one question too, is that you know, we shared such good information today, especially about the difference between brand and brand marketing. That's one that I hope everyone really took away here because it's so valuable to understand the difference. For someone that wants to move on everything that you said, you know, we shared the to-do for the LinkedIn stuff, What's the to-do that you would recommend for someone to learn more about getting the right perspective? What's that first step? Is it following your blog, leading this? Like, what do you recommend someone to do? Look, I mean, fundamentally, there is just so much brilliant content out there. Not just, I mean, not from me, but there are so many incredible leaders that as long as, as, long as um, you are open to seeking. So the way I think about marketing is, is much like a medical profession. You know, it's being a market is like a, not to undermine the medical profession and, and all the physicians and the doctors, but I meant more in terms of the craft. There is never a dearth of new viruses and, and no pun intended, right? It'll, it's an infinite cycle. As long as humans are alive, we'll always get new viruses, but it also means as, as, um, as a physician, you know, or as a medical professional, you have to constantly keep figuring out new vaccines. Marketing is the same way. As, as long as you are engaging with consumers, their habits will keep changing. As long as um, you know, we are operating in this digital world, there'll be new technology, uh, new opportunities with consumer. As marketers, we have to constantly keep evolving ourselves. So the foundationally, what I would say is keep seeking. If you started in brand, you know, challenge yourself to learn about data about technology. You don't have to go deep in every single aspect, but have the appreciation and reasonable enough understanding. Understand the nuance of building a product. If you started in data, appreciate creative, appreciate storytelling, appreciate the impact and power of content. Understand finance because as marketeers, I strongly believe that the future CEOs are going to be these cross-functional marketeers because they understand the customer more than any other function, but we also have to understand the business. We also have to understand numbers and data and finance. Um, and that's what I would say. And there is so much great, incredible content out there. Just keep reading, absorb and constantly learn and challenge yourself and keep evolving. That was such a good answer. And y'all, y'all didn't know. I threw that at him without him knowing. And he just answered with such a great answer right there. And you know, we'll go ahead and close today's webinar, but just want to thank everyone that's on. I love seeing former speakers come and comment. Mayor, I think Betsy even said this is pretty much an MBA. She found very big value from that. You answered Fred's question. You answered Kristen's question. Kristen's our next webinar speaker on human leadership. And y'all, you know, we survived the hurricane down here. Appreciate <laughs> everyone that did come on with that time switch, um, last minute time switch, and we'll keep it going. I sent um, everyone Myers um, LinkedIn. I'll send it again here. Highly recommend for you to follow him. He's one of those guys that, you know, constantly drops knowledge. And he's always sharing and, and really commenting on, like, people's perspectives. Phenomenal teacher, great friend. With that being said, you know, thanks, everyone, for sharing today and showing up. We really appreciate it. And, Mayer, thank you again. You are awesome and excellent, man. Great. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks for having me over. Yeah. Everyone. All right, y'all. We'll see y'all soon. Y'all will see uh, information from us on our next webinar um, this afternoon. Take care, everybody. Bye, everyone. Take care.